The Challenge Cup is a cup with so many uh, history and tradition. Uh, they talk about Wembley making heroes and Wembley in 71 was the defining moment really in Lee's history. It created a fantastic occasion, one of the great upsets in rugby league history as Lee beat Leeds by 24 points to seven. It created heroes that are still revered in the town. Most people who went that day, and there are a lot of us still around, can remember the 13 that played the two substitutes, all the events leading up to the game, the events leading uh, onto the Sunday and the, the open top bus tour around the district, which ended in Lee Town Hall Square. The sort of memories that last a lifetime, uh, just fantastic. Um, the Challenge Cup was inaugurated in 1897 and Batley uh, were the first winners. They beat St Helens in the final at Headingley. And Batley, of course, will share the Wembley stage uh, with ourselves at Wembley this time. So that's very fitting in many ways. Batley were one of the dominant forces in the early history of the Challenge Cup. They won it three times uh, in the early years of the Cup. And Lee got to the semi-final uh, for the first time uh, and, and lost uh, to a very good Oldham side in the third year of the competition. And it was 1921 uh, before we got to the, the very our first Challenge Cup final. It was long before Wembley, actually. Wembley was inaugurated in 1923, the White Horse Cup final in FA Cup final terms, Bolton Wanderers against West Ham United. And the Rugby League finally took the Challenge Cup final to Wembley in 1929. So when we reached the cup final in 21, it was played at the Cliff at Broughton, uh, which was later taken over by Manchester United as a training venue. It was a time of great industrial strife and depression, the years just after the First World War. And a lot of the pits and the cotton mills were either on reduced hours or were on strike. So a lot of the Lee supporters either walked or cycled uh, to Broughton, maybe 12 or 13 miles away. Uh, we played Halifax that day, went into the game as massive underdogs. Had an inspirational scrum half called Walter Mooney. Now, Walter Mooney worked uh, down the pit at Tilsley Gin Pit. Uh, my granddad uh, worked with him. So there's kind of history for me going back over 100 years. He was a, a a barrel of a man, five foot four, as wide as he was tall. He used to tackle everything in sight. It was irrepressible. Uh, during the summer months, he used to take part in wrestling sessions at the old Mother Lane ground. So he'd take on all comers at wrestling. And he used to attract bigger crowds than Lee did for the rugby games in the winter. Um, and some great stories about that Lee side. Ernie Boardman was the loose forward. And Ernie's grandson, Ron, uh, is a Lee supporter uh, to this day. Uh, Ernie's father, Tom, uh, was a long-standing Lee supporter, reached over 100 years, uh, was a special guest of us only a few years ago, sadly passed away. But Ron keeps up the family tradition. So lots of great stories. Tommy Clarkson, the fullback, his shirts uh, from that final are in Bond Street Labour Club in the centre of Lee. Uh, some amazing stories, really. So 21 cup final, beat Halifax 13-0, Lee have broken the duck. They actually won the cup before either Wigan or St Helens won the cup. It was 1924 uh, before Wigan won the Challenge Cup for the first time. It was the 50s before St Helens won it for the first time. So that gives a sort of indication of the scale of the achievement. We never thought we'd ever get to the cup final again, so I'm told. We had a great team in the 50s uh, before I was born. People like Jimmy Leggard, the fullback, and Joe Egan, Charlie Pawsey, fantastic team. Reached the semi final three times, never got to the final. Great players in the 60s like Mick Martin, Bill Robinson, Walt Tabern, never got to play in a cup final. Same with John Woods, whose statue is outside Leeds Sports Village, never got to play in a Challenge Cup final. Finally, I think we owe it to the great Tommy Sale. He really laid the foundations for our Challenge Cup win in 71. There was a great scrum half played for St Helens and Great Britain. He took on the Aussies at 18 and won the Ashes. Alexander James Murphy, born just before the Second World War. 
There are people in St Helens, as Dennis Whittle, the old journalist, used to tell me, who used to blame Alex for starting the Second World War. Irrepressible character, probably the greatest rugby league player that ever trod on the field. He fell out with St Helens in the late 60s. They wanted him to play centre rather than half-back. So he was in dispute, wasn't playing. Tommy Sale went to meet him at a golf club one day and said, uh, we'd like you to come to Lee. He said, well, St Helens won't release me. And if they do, the transfer fee will be too big. Oh, we don't want you as a player, said Tommy. We want you as a coach. So he came in as coach in the late 60s and gradually built a team that was to achieve the ultimate goal a few years later. And in a short space of time, St Helens realised they had to cut the losses and they agreed a transfer fee. So we not only got a great coach, we got a great player as well. And Murphy, everyone you speak to who played under him, they'll say he was an inspirational coach, a motivational type of coach. Very different in character to Adrian Lamb, but similar in that an amazing knowledge of rugby league and an amazing knowledge of how to get the best out of his players and also an appreciation of the other team he was up against, their tactics, how best to overcome them. Murphy's tactics on the way to Wembley were, we'll play our rugby at Wembley. In those days, you got two points for a drop goal. So the tactics were, every time you got to the other end of the field, to come away with something. We had Murphy, we had Kevin Ashcroft, Jimmy Fiddler, all people who could drop goals. And we had a fantastic goal-kicking fullback or winger called Stuart Ferguson, who we signed from Swansea Rugby Union. And he was just about the best goal kicker you will ever see. He used to get his boots. There was a boot maker on the way into Bolton called Norman Walsh. It was on the left-hand side down St Helens Road near Dobble. And it was quite a modest looking shop. It just said N Walsh, boot maker. And all the top footballers and all the top rugby league players, they all used to go to Norman Walsh. You'd have Bobby Charlton, you'd have George Best, You'd have all the stars of football, you'd have all the stars of rugby league. And he would tailor his boots according to that individual player. Kevin Ashcroft, our hooker, used to get boots from there. Stuart Ferguson, the goal kicker. And Stuart's boots were made out of soft black leather. It was long before the days of sponsorship. So soft black leather with metal studs and then a, a toe cap in the front of the boot. And that's what was one of his secrets of his goal kicking style because Stuart he used to line the ball up. There were no kicking tees in those days. He used to just make a divot with his heel, line the ball up straight at the post, and then walk back, no round the corner style. He used to walk back and then come in a rhythmical run, and he used to boot the ball with the, his toe end. Incredible unerring accuracy. And at Wembley that day, Stuart gave one of the finest displays of goal kicking you'll ever see. The Wembley authorities had never seen anything like it. And that whole team that Murphy put together, it was a team really of, a lot of players had been rejected by other clubs, and considered not good enough. They all had a point to prove. A lot of them had never played in a match as big as that, as that. maybe thought they never would. But Murphy gelled them all into this incredible team that all knew their jobs, all played for one another, all played for the town. And it was an incredible experience, very similar to the team of 2023. You just sensed that something was building as each round was won. We beat Hull in the quarter-final at Hilton Park, absolutely packed Hilton Park that day. We won eight points to two, no tries. We went to the semi-final at Central Park Wigan against Huddersfield won 10 points to four. Probably the worst game of rugby league you've ever seen in your life. Safety first tactics by Murphy. All goals again, no tries. We'll play our rugby at Wembley. We'll play our rugby at Wembley. That was his mantra, and we did. And led by Murphy, it was just irrepressible that day. We were up against the lead side, full of superstars. They were considered odds-on favourites. But every lead player I've spoken to, it never even entered their heads that we might not win. And with Murphy at the front, lots of things happened in that game, which we can maybe talk about. But the belief that they took into that game, 
the game plan, as they now call, they didn't have game plans in those days, they were just called tactics. Uh, the motivation, the togetherness, it gave Lee, until we go to Wembley this time, the greatest day really in the town's history. Do you see any similarities between that team and the way that team is assembled and the way that Adrian's built his team today? Yeah, he's got a very, uh, there's lots of similarities, lots of players in the, in the pack. Uh, it's hard to compare eras because rugby league in 1971 was far different than today. Uh, there were only two substitutes and it was a four tackle rule instead of the six tackle rule. So that um, affected the tactics quite a lot. Also, there were so many head high tackles, tackles around the shoulders. It was a brutal era for rugby league. A lot of players suffered broken jaws and you had to protect your, your best players against the headhunters. Uh, it, each team had a kind of enforcer or someone whose job it was to protect the ball players, the star players in the team. It was a, a different type of era. Rugby league was also a little bit in the doldrums in the 60s and early 70s. So it was going through a, a period of introspection and a lot of concerns over the future of the game. It was the closing era of Bill Fallerfield, who'd been at head of the rugby league for a long, long time. And it was only three years afterwards that David Oxley and David Howes came into the rugby league and revitalised, really, the game in so many different ways. Uh, but 71, you look at that team, we had David Eckersley at fullback. Fantastic player, David Eckersley. Just a, a lee lad, just so much natural ability. So you could compare him with, say, Gareth O'Brien. Very, very similar styles, safe under the high ball. Knew exactly when to join the attack. Intuitive rugby player, just like Gareth is. I mean, what a clever player Gareth O'Brien is. Just fantastic player. So lots of similarities there. Um, the three-quarter line. Stuart Ferguson was in for his goal kicking. Uh, he was a solid winger. But on the left wing, we've now got... Josh Charnley. In, then, in those days, we had an irrepressible winger. He looked like the fifth Beatle called Joe Walsh. Anyone who remembered Joe Walsh, what a, he, he'd run through a brick wall. He had a mop of black hair. He was the team joker. He kept everyone's spirits up. He was a, a, from Widnes, uh, just an amazing uh, character. And just... What a character Joe Walsh was. He, he, he just fearless, uh, run into forwards, do all the hard yards. Great finisher as well, good turn of speed. Two good centres, Stan Dorrington, who scored the first try at Wembley, and Mick Collins, who played over 400 games. Absolutely rock solid. So comparisons there with the likes of Ricky Latelli and Zach Hardacre, that type of player. Um, in the halves, uh, we had Tony Barrow, who... Uh, was a, a loose forward who, who switched to standoff. Tony was a rock-solid rugby league player again, knew the game inside out, later had a, a good career as a coach. He, he, he was a centre for St. Helens in the 60s with Tom Van Bollenhoven, the great winger, as his winger. So he could play any position, really, Tony. And Tony was just an astute rugby league player. And he was really the foil for Murphy's brilliance because Murphy just had everything. He had searing pace, he had an amazing rugby brain. He, he, he could see things before anyone else on a rugby field. His kicking, his awareness, his bravery above all else because he was often the target for the opposition. And in that Wembley final with Murphy bossing it and Lee well ahead, about 15 minutes from the end, uh, Murphy was taken out by Sid Hines of Leeds and Hines became the first player in a rugby league cup final to be sent off. Murphy was stretched off, uh, though he recovered to uh, go up to the, uh, the steps at Wembley and collect the cup. Uh, lots of great stories about that incident. And Sid Hines, to this day, maintains he was innocent. But you look at Murphy, you look at Lachlan Lamb, you look at Adrian Lamb, who was a fantastic scrum half as well. The sort of fulcrum, really, of the side, the kind of inspiration of the side. You look at Lachlan's performance in the semi-final against St. Helens, the way after half-time he was involved in those two tries. That was Murphy all over. His 
his ability to suddenly influence a game with a, a sudden piece of magic that no one else could, could do. And that ability to make the very difficult things look remarkably simple. Because Murphy did the difficult things day after day, week after week, just as Lachlan Lamb does. It makes it look deceptively easy. Uh, we had a, a hooker called Kevin Ashcroft who very different in style to Edwin Apapi. I'm sure Kevin wouldn't mind me saying that. But again, a, a huge influence on the side. He was kind of Murphy's le lieutenant, really. Uh, and a, 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 another player who played a lot of rugby league, 600 games, played for Great Britain. And it was Kevin, really, who not only had a great influence on the 71 side, but he had a much bigger influence, you might argue, on Lee's subsequent history. He had a number of roles after he finished uh, his playing days. He was twice coach of the club, but he was also employed as a commercial manager. And he used to go around Lee, drumming up business, match sponsorship, uh, kit sponsorship, that type of thing. And one day he went into a, a business, a, a young entrepreneur had set up uh, a double glazing business at Butts Bridge. And Kevin went in to persuade him to take out a match sponsorship. Now, anyone who knows Kevin would know that he certainly uh, doesn't lack uh, vocabulary or uh, motivational uh, skills. Uh, he could sell anything really. And that day, um, he met this young entrepreneur and he, um, he explained to him that if he took out sponsorship with Lee, it would greatly enhance his profile in the town and uh, would help his business. And so that was the first time that Derek Beaumont got involved in, in Lee Rugby. And uh, we, we owe Kevin, really, for that introduction, as, as Derek will uh, a, a, attest. So that was quite a... When you think of what's Derek achieve, what Derek has achieved with this club and how he's a, uh, achieved his dream, uh, Kevin Ashcroft was there at the start. And even more remarkably, uh, Derek was, was born in 1971, which kind of adds poignancy. Uh, to the story. Uh, the other uh, prop forwards that day, uh, alongside Kevin in the front row, were Derek Watts, and uh, he, uh, he, he, was, <laughs> he came to Lee in remarkable circumstances. Murphy actually put out an advert in the paper advertising for rugby league players, and out of that advert, he got two forwards who played at Wembley. He got Derek Watts, who was a rugby union player, who was playing in Tembury Wells in Worcestershire, and he got Paul Grimes, who was a giant of a man, who was playing in uh, Newcastle upon Tyne. They both came for trials, and they both turned out to be fantastic players. And Murphy gelled them into into rugby league players. So uh, that was incredible. Uh, what Murphy, what Murphy achieved there in uh, in that. So Dave Chisnell was our star prop forward. He he got a suspension and missed out on Wembley. So Jimmy Fiddler. Uh, came into the front row. He was a, a really skillful player, uh, a good kicking forward as well. In the second row, we had uh, we had Paul Grimes, uh, and uh, Peter Smethurst uh, was a loose forward. He was someone who'd played. He was coming towards the end of his career, uh, never played at Wembley, and uh, just you know remarkable really uh, what he achieved and. Uh, we also had um, Jeff Clarkson, who probably made more moves uh, in, in a career than any other player. 14 or 15 moves, twice at Lee. He played in 71 in the cup final, and then he came back 11 years later when Murphy was back as coach and played in the 82 championship winning side. Uh, and he was another really solid forward. Then on the bench, we had Chisnall, uh, part of the Chisnall dynasty, and Roy Lester. And, and Roy, um, unfortunately, never took the field that day, uh, but still was part of history and still is really proud that he played for Lee uh, at Wembley in 71. So it, it was just a fantastic day, Terry. It was just amazing. We've all watched it back many times. The iconic Eddie Waring commentary. Uh, David Eckersley's brilliant individual try, which kind of climaxed it. And all Leeds got out of it was a, a late obstruction try. So 24-7, it was meant to be a, a Leeds cakewalk. Leeds were red hot favourites. And it was uh, little old Lee, as Dave Woods called us the other day, who triumphed and what a fantastic day. 85,000, I think, were in Wembley, but we all, uh, 
Uh, there must have been 30, 40,000 from Lee. It was just a sea of red and white. Following day, um, they came back to Newtonley Willows train station and then uh, got on an open top bus, went on a, a tour of Booth's Town, Astley, Tilsley, Aberton, all the streets of Lee, ended up in Lee Town Hall Square. Just a mass of people uh, all took the bows on the Town Hall uh, balcony. Uh, just fantastic day, just memories of uh, a lifetime. I, mean, I was lucky enough to be there, uh, went with my mum and dad. My mum's 97 now and still remembers that day. In fact, if I've been to a Lee game and I've been doing uh, Premier Club uh, with Jill, I quite often have my suit on. Then I go and see her in the care home and she says, oh, you're, you're dressed smart for change. Have, have you been to work? And I say, no, I've been to Lee. Um, and she always says the same thing. Um, oh, we're, we're Kevin Ashcroft and Alex Murphy there. And, it's, it, and that's the kind of impact they made. She always asks that question. So that's the kind of impact it made on my mum. Everyone's got similar stories to tell. There's loads of people who'll be going to Wembley uh, who'll have similar stories to me uh, and just amazing memories and just memories that you can pass on to generations. And yeah, 71 was part of Lee Folklore. 2023 will be in exactly the same way. So you talked there about your relationship with your mother and how that sort of, the her relationship with Lee has stood the test of time. How important is it that the players this time around can give the fans today the same experiences? I think we've got a very, very astute coach. We've got a person who comes around to a club once in a lifetime, I would say. As soon as I knew Adrian um, from his playing days, um, I used to do a radio programme on Radio Lancashire every Wednesday night and uh, it was an hour long programme and I used to uh, have rugby league players as guests and used to go and pick them up, uh, take them into Blackburn, which isn't a rugby league hotbed, uh, do an interview, take them home and in those days you could literally ring anyone up in rugby league and they would come into Blackburn for you. So you could ring up Tony Smith who was coach Huddersfield and Tony would drive over from Huddersfield, no problem. Uh, Steve McNamara would come in from Hull. I mean, it was just amazing the, the things that people did. And Adrian was just like everyone else. He was fantastic. Came in several times. People like Brian Carney, Chris Radlinski, all the Wigan side of that era. And um, so I got to know Adrian well then. And he played at Wigan with Chris Chester, um, halfback combination. So... They knew each other, uh, they knew each other well. And I, I followed Adrian's career after he left Wigan. He went back to Australia in the NRL, assistant coach, and then became involved with the, the Kangaroos. Then he came back to Wigan as coach. Uh, the COVID year led them with great dignity uh, throughout all the issues there. Came within a whisker of winning a grand final, Super League coach of the year. Following the year, he left Wigan. And... Uh, as chairman, we, we were, Derek was rebuilding the club after relegation in 2021. And it was almost like Friends Reunited. He got Chris Chester in as head of rugby, which was a fantastic thing to do. And someone, something that I heavily uh, supported. Because not only is Chris uh, a really good person, he's very, very astute and he's a rugby uh, aficionado, he knows every single player in rugby league, he watches rugby all the time and he's made that transition from playing to coaching to being a manager really really well and then his master stroke was bringing in Adrian Lamb as coach and Adrian right from the outset immersed himself in the history of Lee, he wanted to know what the tradition of the club was, the tradition of the time, what made everyone tick and that was Remarkable, the sort of uh, depth of um, knowledge that he wanted to know about the club. And ever since that day, I've seen that attention to detail manifest itself in so many different ways. And it manifested itself just before our cup tie against Wakefield this year. Um, a lot of the Australian players 
who come to this country don't realise the importance of the tradition of the Challenge Cup because they don't have a, a Challenge Cup over there. Uh, they'll have heard of it maybe, or there is, there's lots of Australian players of, who've starred at Wembley. But by and large, in Australia, it's all about the grand final and getting to the NRL grand final. So he asked uh, Derek and me to give a little talk to all the players before the Wakefield game and just explain the importance of the Challenge Cup and what it meant to the club, the town, the people of Lee. So I recounted uh, my experiences of 71 uh, and how the, the, with you forever, how Derek was born in 71, how when we got together in 2013, Derek came in and uh, into the club again and invited me in. Um, that was our aim, 21-71. We were going to get to the cup final in 2021. That was our aim. We got there in 2019 to the semi-final of the AB Sundex Cup. Played Widnes here at Lee Sports Village. If we'd won, we'd have got to Wembley. Uh, we lost Keenan Brambers in the Widnes side that day. It wasn't to be, oh well, 2021, it's two years away. Then Covid came and uh, difficult times for everyone. We missed out uh, on Wembley in 2021. 2022, AB Sundex Cup, get to the final. It's at Tottenham, win the final. Fantastic experience for everyone. It's not Wembley. It's not Wembley for a reason. That's exactly the way we looked at it. Then 2023 comes along. Well, we've lost two years to Covid. So 2023 is really 2021. And Derek explained that. And I'll always remember, he said, I've had a dream about going to Wembley and lifting the cup. And he said, every dream I've ever had has come true. And he said, we're going to beat Wakefield. And in the next round, we're going to play York and we're going to beat York. And then we're in the semi-final. And when we're in the semi-final, anything could happen. And Gareth O'Brien was sat on the front row and he was listening quite intently. And when Derek suddenly said, I've had a dream and all my dreams come true, Gareth kind of shot, he shot bolt upright in his chair. And it kind of, that, that sort of dawning realisation, what, what we're dealing with here. And wow. <laughs> and the whole room was kind of, I don't know, it's hard to, when you give a talk or recollections, it's hard to know it's, how it's received, but I actually got an incredible buzz out of that shot. It was only 10, 10 minutes maybe. But the energy in the room, the, the feeling, the team spirit, the comradeship, the determination, the desire. If we'd have had a game five minutes later, we'd have gone out and won it. Absolutely no problem. So it's funny, I went home that day and I said to my wife, we're going to win the cup this year. Oh, she said, how many times have I heard that? How many times have I... I said, I'm telling you, we are going to win the cup this year. I said, you've only just experienced what I've experienced. And ever since then, we beat Wakefield, we drew York while we're playing York. And then we're playing St. Helens. And we were there, I was there in 87. The last time we were in a Challenge Cup semi-final, we played St. Helens. Um, Heroic performance from that lead side. Lost 14-8. A game of ifs and buts. We could so easily have won that game. Dominated the second half. But you kind of went out of Central Park that day thinking, that's our one and only chance to get to Wembley. It's going to be a while before we get in this situation again. I didn't really feel that on Saturday uh, for the St. Helens game. I spoke to a few people before the game and said, how do you feel? I said, well, 87. I thought it was a one-off chance. This year, whatever happens against St. Helens, I just feel that it's the start of something really big. It's not the be-all and end-all. Whatever happens, it's just the start of something. We're on an incredible roller coaster. All the pieces have fallen into place, just like they did in Murphy with 71. But this time, it's even stronger. It's even better. We've, e we've got even better players. We've got players that you've never... You have to pinch yourself to look at some of the players who are playing for Lee and you think, he's playing for Lee. John Arciata is playing for Lee. Edwin Apapi, Josh Charnley. You could go through the whole side. They're playing for Lee and you sort of think, wow, what are we watching here? This is, this is just special. And you've got Adrian Lamb, you've got Tony Club, you've got Paul Johnson, 
you've got Steve Maiden, you've got everyone involved in the coaching staff, you've got Cordy, all the stats guy. They've all experienced so many things together in rugby league. They're all together. The whole club's together. It's, it's, it's an incredible feeling. It's like a, it's just like Wembley 71 in many ways, that momentum, that belief, that incredible team spirit and that manifested itself in that semi-final, that defensive display. Some of the tackles they made and the, some of the last gas tackles, the way they defended the line, the way they withstood so much pressure and then were able to come out and play such great rugby and score the tries. That was exactly what Murphy did and what the lead team of 71. So, yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, the, whole, the whole experience and it was kind of, it was meant to be. Uh, for all the reasons I've explained. The biggest reason of all is Derek's dream. And it, he said something really pertinent, didn't he, at the end of the game. It was caught on the BBC cameras and a lot of people have repeated it and taken a lot of comfort from it. He said, you, you only fail at something when you stop trying. And for all the ups and downs of the last 10 years, and goodness knows there have been plenty, his desire and that dedication and that ambition to achieve what we've now achieved has never, never dimmed, and we owe everything to him. Well, it's Peter Makinson. Makinson's chip over the top. Yeah.